Hello, everyone. Uh, so today uh, we have Rowan from University of Washington. Uh, Rowan is a third year PhD student uh, uh, working with uh, Yejin Choi and Ali Farhadi. His research focuses on AI models that deeply uh, understand and reason about the world through both vision and language. He is the recipient of an NSF fellowship and is currently uh, interning at AI2. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Hi. Uh, thanks, Amid, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about, I guess, ostensibly building robust, better data sets for common sense reasoning. But I think we can go even a little bit beyond that in this talk, uh, talking about kind of just giving AI, like make it, making deep models better and um, expanding the range of what we can do. So hopefully it should be pretty interesting and exciting. Um, yeah, so kind of let's get started. So again, my main interest is building language and vision systems that also have a rich understanding of how the world works. So this direction might be kind of weird, but it, to me it's really important because the rules of the world kind of encompass everything that we do. Uh, so really maybe the picture should look like this. Like humans take it for granted, for instance, that if you drink from a cup, it'll cause it to become empty. Or if I enter a building, that necessarily means that that building is larger than I am. Uh, but obviously, it's hard for AI systems to understand this right now, or much less to reason about them. So in this talk, I'm going to call this rich capability that humans have common sense reasoning. And we're going to be talking about approaches for bringing AI systems to these human-like levels of common sense reasoning and understanding. So I'm going to start by showing you an example by what I mean by common sense reasoning. So it'll go something like this. I'm going to give you a context, and you have to pick the most likely continuation. So it goes, a man has a few tools, and he's pumping his car up so he can take off the tire. He... A, stops on the front of the bike and moves it to the left. B, gets out of the car while leaving the engine running. C, uses the tool to take off all the nuts one by one. Or D, goes down from the cars, landing straight in. So as a human summarizing these four examples, I'd say that C is probably the right answer for what's going to happen next. However, this answer, choosing this answer, isn't obvious a priori without reasoning about the world. In fact, in its most general form, this is an example, I'm going to say, of common sense knowledge that requires natural language or natural language inference. So this example is just one from my paper from EMNLP 2018 called SWAG, a large-scale adversarial data set for grounded common sense inference. So for this section of the talk, we're going to talk about two main components. First, I'm going to introduce the SWAG dataset, which contains over 100,000 multiple choice questions similar to the last one. And then I'm going to then introduce adversarial filtering, which is a novel approach for building challenging datasets at scale. So let's take a step back and kind of talk about a little bit about natural language inference, which is this broad problem in NLP. So we can sort of think about it as trying to gauge what information about the world that we as humans can pick up on from a sentence. However, a lot of the past work in this area has focused primarily on linguistic-based knowledge and reasoning. And to make this, these kinds of ling- ling- linguistics-based inferences often doesn't require much common sense reasoning. So for example, from the SNLI data set, we have sentences like these. A woman is talking on the phone while standing next to a dog. And we're asked to determine if the sentence, a woman is talking on the phone, is entailed. But this is true primarily because the context is just the intersection between talking on the phone and then also standing next to a dog. Similarly, given the sentence, a man is doing tricks on a skateboard, we'd probably say that the sentence, nobody is doing tricks, is a contradiction. And that's because the quantifier here, nobody, is going to negate the verb doing tricks. On the other hand, the framing here of natural language inference has always been quite general. So the early sketch of this task intentionally encompassed both a common understanding of language as well as a common understanding about how the world works and using these both when you're reasoning about whether uh, an answer is entailed or not. 
So for instance, what I mean here is that as humans, we probably haven't memorized the how-to guide for how to take off a car tire. But we could probably guess that if you're going to take off the car tire, at some point you're probably going to want to remove the nuts that connect it there. So in our work, in the SWAG data set, we explicitly have constructed a task in a data set to emphasize common sense reasoning in NLI. So our data set is going to be called SWAG for situations with adversarial generations. And it contains over 110,000 challenging multiple choice NLI questions collected using video caption data. So in this case, the context sentence about a man pumping up the car tire, uh, or sorry, a pumping up the car comes from a video caption. And the correct answer, that he's going to use the tool to take off all the nuts one by one, is going to come from the actual next caption of the next event in the video. So I want to emphasize here, though, that even though we pull this language from the vis visual world, our final task is going to be language only. So models will never see the video, and nor do they see any fun clip art that I just added for this talk. Still, this is going to raise at least one important question for me, which is, how do we get the wrong answers for this task in a good way? And so to tackle this problem, we introduce a new approach in our work called adversarial filtering. But before I get into the details of adversarial filtering, I want to discuss a little bit about problems that exist in large data sets. So recent work has found, amongst other things, that large data sets contain what's known as annotation artifacts. And these are stylistic patterns that give unwanted clues for the labels. And, that, and the, so these are really important because we find that machines easily pick up on these stylistic clues. And they often emerge from shortcuts that humans take to efficiently write text that satisfies the, the requirements in crowdsourcing. So for instance, one pattern in the SNLI data set that I talked about earlier is negation. So given a sentence, you just change a phrase like a man to nobody, and then it will become a contradiction. But this means that a model, like our machine here, can just see the word nobody in the second sentence, ignore the rest of the answer, or sorry, the, the second sentence, and instantly have high confidence that it's just seen a contradiction. So that's probably not very good. So with SWAG, we're going to take a different approach. And it, to, me, to the best of my knowledge, it's one of the first of its kind. So the right answers are going to come from the video captions, but instead we'll have machines write the wrong endings. And instead of writing endings, humans will verify that the real endings make more sense than the wrong ones. Still though, that's not going to be enough. Because as anyone who looks at machine-generated text knows, it's going to have artifacts of its own. And some of these you can even pick up on using simple uh, stylistic models. So we're going to do exactly this but with a twist. And that twist is going to be called adversarial filtering. So instead of ju just generating a couple of endings, we're going to massively oversample candidate endings at scale using AI models. And we'll use a different set of AI models to select the wrong endings that stylistically look like real ones. And this process we're going to call adversarial filtering. So I'm going to dive into this process in a little bit more detail. So given a context, and a second sentence, we're going to break the second sentence up into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And we'll use a language model to massively overgenerate possible counterfactuals. So here, he goes out onto the street. Instead of using the tool to take off all of the nuts one by one, he sits looking at the man. He goes down from the cars, landing straight in, and he hauls the car over the bridge. So these are just four that I'm giving you, but in practice, we're going to generate thousands of these. And we can represent these compactly in math notation as x1 plus for the positive example and x1 i minus for the i negative example. So and when you expand this out, here's one picture of a subset of the entire data set. So each column here is going to be a different data point. So I just want to mention I'm going to be focusing on this small example for clarity, but in practice, this will scale for the entire data set. Now, we're going to break this up into a dummy training set and a dummy test set. And we'll train a model, f theta, or we call it the filtering model, on the training set. And this model's goal is to determine whether it thinks that an ending has been written by a human or by a machine. 
So we'll use this model to score the endings by on the test set. So in this case, the model thinks that x53 minus and x62 minus were machine generated. So we'll remove those endings and we'll replace them with new endings that the model thinks are human generated. And so I want to mention here that this is going to result in a particular train test split that happens to be adversarial to this filtering model. But our end goal isn't for that. We want any split of this data set to be adversarial. So we're going to repeat this process for a few more iterations. Training a new filtering model in a new training set, filtering the test set, and we'll just continue until convergence. So that's really all adversarial filtering is in a nutshell. But I want to pause for a second, take a step back, and summarize briefly what this process is going to do and what it's not going to do. So uh, th maybe this is a bit basic, but in the conventional machine learning setup, we're going to assume that, we, we have to assume, I guess, that our training data comes exactly from the same distribution as our test data. And so when this distribution is pretty simple, conventional machine learning models will do really well at generalizing, if you call it that. But what if the test set comes from a different distribution? So actually, I'm bringing this up because this is where a lot of the past work that you might be familiar with that has the, the, ter the name adversarial examples comes in. And in, in a lot of these past works, if you just give a model that you train on a data set weird input that falls out of the same distribution, it's not going to generalize very well. So in this setting, obviously, you can guess that models won't do that well. But maybe that's behind the, beside the point. Because this assumption sort of underscores everything that we do in machine learning, that we're going to test on similar data to what we trained on. So in adversarial filtering, we're going to try and go about this in a different way. And we're trying to answer this open question of, what happens if we make the test data come from exactly the same distribution as the training data, but it's just a really interesting high-dimensional distribution that machines can't pick up on? So ideally, this will try and confuse models. And that's going to be our goal with the adversarial filtering process, trying to get as interesting of a distribution as possible that even if you evaluate on stuff within the same distribution, models won't generalize. And so I wanted to give like one slide where I talk a tiny bit more formally in, about how this works. So there's going to be some math here. We have a data set D, which is just a bunch of input-output pairs x being the features and y being the labels. And we have a model, f, that goes from the space of inputs to a distribution over the outputs. We have a loss function, l, that takes as input the model and the data set and returns some value. And we're going to define this term, the empirical error, as being the average loss over all points in our data set uh, where, the, where the model is f theta I star. And what I mean by that is it's going to be the model that where the best parameters to that model are going to be determined by all of the other data points. So in other words here, by empirical error, what I mean is this question of how much does knowing n minus 1 data points help to generalize to the nth? And so what, now that I'm setting this up, I guess I'm trying, I, I'd like to, to mention that with adversarial filtering, we're trying to we're trying to maximize this data set level empirical error as much as possible. We want to make it so that knowing n minus 1 data points doesn't help you to predict the last one. And by doing this on like splits that might be larger than one, that's just like a computational way um, to hopefully achieve, I guess, as high of an entropy you could think of as possible. So that's adversarial filtering. Still, one component that I haven't mentioned, which is kind of important, is the choice of the filtering models that you used. So for SWAG, we used an ensemble of stylistic models, which is similar to what was used in a lot of these prior work uh, to analyze the scope of the data set biases. And you can actually, if you just run the stylistic models on a bunch of other data sets like SNLI, you do uh, like surprisingly well. So the components of this ensemble were a multilayer perceptron given language model perplexities, a bag of words model, a convolutional neural network, and a BIOSTM, where the uncommon words are replaced by the parts of speech tags. So at the beginning of adversarial filtering, our ensemble is going to get 93% binary classification accuracy at telling apart a balanced set of machine and human written endings. However, 
After 100 iterations of this adversarial filtering process, the accuracy of the stylistic models will drop to chance. And last but not least, to, collect the, uh, to finalize the data set, we have crowd workers who validate the data set. Because in this, the reason why we do this is because we want to remove adversarial endings that seem realistic, and thus to a normal person could get confused with the real endings. So, oh yeah. Did you, me did you measure the accuracy of, of like a fifth stylistic model after you did this? Uh, or, or do it for three and like leave one out stylistic to see how well it filters for not the models you filtered by? Yeah, so actually we have a bunch of experiments where we use stylistic models even after the human validation, which I think is an even stronger claim because the human validation might change things, if that makes sense. Yeah, but good question. Yeah. But you use different stylistic models than these four? Yes, Okay. exactly. So these crowd workers yeah. see the starting sentences, but I assume the adversarial filters do not. Uh, yes. But if you wanted to, the adversarial filters could see both. And we've actually done a couple of experiments way after. I mean, this is a separate point, but where you condition on that. Cool. So I want to pause for a second and say that I find adversarial filtering exciting for a couple of reasons. Maybe people here are interested. So first, it means that the diversity of the sentences in your corpus will, limit it, will be limited only by your source data set and, it, and for those models that you chose for, for filtering and generation. Importantly, it won't be limited by the creativity of human writers. So second, it allows for the dataset creator to arbitrarily raise the bar of difficulty during dataset construction. So the adversarial filters could be as powerful or as weak as you want. So third, it's cheap. Workers don't write the endings, but they only, they, all they do is they validate them, which means it's easy for them and they generally love the task. So now the next question is, what's the performance of various models on Swag? So note that random performance is 25%. You're given four answers for each question. Human performance is 88%. So a bag of words text classification model, like fast text, and we didn't use fast text during the training, by the way, gets 30%. Using an LSTM on the entire question and answer, plus glove embeddings, gets 46 If you use eSIM, which is a model that's been proposed for natural language inference, and you toss in glove embeddings, you get 53%. And then if you augment eSIM with ELMO embeddings, you get 59%. So these are all the experiments we ran in the original paper because that's what was out a year ago when we did these experiments. However, you might be aware, if you follow the NLP drama, I guess, in the community, that, these new, that there are new recently released approaches that do representation learning at scale, and they do even better. So OpenAI GPT gets 78%, and BERT from Google gets 86%. So this is really exciting, because it means that we're making progress towards what's ostensibly common sense reasoning. And in particular, yeah? So for GPT and BERT, yeah. I assume you just took the original models and then added a layer, one layer, and trained that top. Yep, and, and BERT, they, the, that's exactly, like the details are in their paper. OpenAI GPT, it's exactly the same as for they did rock stories, but yeah. Um, so I guess I want to say that the strong performance of these models, particularly OpenAI GPT and BERT, indicates that pre-training is critical for this task. But it still raises a lot of questions, essentially since the task as I, uh, or the data set as I have constructed it is pretty much solved at this point. The most important one to me is what's next? Well, so we, let's unpack these results a little bit. So first off, we found that while pre-training is important, it's not all that's required for swag. So we did these experiments with OpenAI GPT originally, and you can, uh, we also did them for BERT and about the same thing holds. If you vary the number of training examples, you find that the model needs to fine tune on swag to obtain competitive performance. And this is regardless of whether it's given the question and the answer choices or just the answer. So digging a little deeper, what is it that models learn, especially deep ones, by fine tuning on swag? Well, so in our work in the paper, we found that video captions use a wider range of verbs compared with image captions. And this is awesome for studying things like event dynamics. Because there are, and there are a lot of in interesting phenomena in our data set too. Like in this case, there's a woman doing the monkey bars. However, this video that I've just shown isn't unique. There are 43 other videos in ActivityNet captions, one of the source data sets of someone going on the monkey bars. And since the granularity of the visual world is often lost with captions, these clips will result in similar data set examples. 
Cool. So the next, the next question, can you construct a two-sentence NLI data set at scale while being resistant to these deep pre-training approaches? And I can't go into the details too much in this talk because of lack of time and because this is super new, but I think the answer is yes. So I have some work in progress that essentially shows that if you just increase the number of iterations for adversarial filtering and you use BERT rather than stylistic adversaries, then you can get, uh, you, you can essentially confuse uh, BERT so much that um, you can do the same thing again. However, in the rest of this talk, I want to transition to a different direction. And so, and, and it comes from this observation that some situations are going to be difficult to fully express in terms of natural language alone. So, for instance, suppose I have a caption like this one. So someone is pointing at someone else, the waiter, dot, dot, dot. And to infer what might happen next, which could be very broad, it would help if I could see the visual world that this was referring to. Aha, but here's this image now. So, thankfully, computer vision has gotten really far at answering perceptual questions about the world. And maybe that could help us answer this. So, for instance, a model can detect many of the objects in the scene and provide high quality scene segmentation masks. And in fact, these models come from Mask RCNN. I didn't, um, I didn't uh, do this myself. This is all machine generated. Still, though, these objects by themselves don't tell the whole story. What I want to know instead is why is person four, the person on the right, pointing at person one, who's on the left? This question, or rather an answer to this question, is highly challenging because it requires us to know exactly what is going on in the entire situation. So maybe if I'm a human and I'm looking at this, my chain of reasoning would be follows. So person one, person two, and person four, the people who are at the table, are at a diner. They've previously ordered food. And person three is the waitress who is bringing them their food. And she has a plate of pancakes in her hand, but uh, while person four is pointing at person one. So therefore, one reasonable answer to this question might be that person four is telling person one, or sorry, telling person three that person one ordered the pancakes that person three is currently holding. Phew, that's, that was a complicated inference. But it still raises the question of how can we, if, if it's hard for us to communicate or ask these questions, how can we get vision systems to learn this? So this is going to be, the perfect transition to my new paper that I recently released about visual common sense reasoning. And we're going to hopefully answer this question. So we propose in our work to capture diverse inferences using a simple multiple choice evaluation setting. The model is given a question and four answer choices, and it has to pick the right answer. So in this case, the answers are that A, he is telling person three that person one ordered the pancakes. B, he just told a joke. C, he is feeling accusatory towards person one, or D, he is given person one directions. So as you can see from these answers, A is right. But they also have the unique property that they're all relevant to the question, and maybe for a different image they could be true. But only A makes sense here. Yeah? So is there any part that you like, uh, is, the, is the model is able to explain why it selected A, for example? That's a good question. I'll get, you, I'll get you the answer to that in like two slides. But as Hamid pointed out, multiple choice is not going to be enough. Because as many of you all know, existing AI systems often do really well at these tasks, but do so for questionable reasons. And this is called the Clever Hans effect. After Clever Hans, who is this horse who could ostensibly do arithmetic, but really he was just mimicking the body language of his trainer. So. Because of this issue, we are going to address this problem by making explanations a critical part of this task. So now, after answering the question correctly, a model is going to have to justify its reasoning. And in this case, the four possible justifications are A, person one has the pancakes in front of him. B, person four is taking everyone's order and asked for clarification. C, person three is looking at the pancakes, and both she and person two are smiling slightly. Or D, Person three is delivering food to the table, and she might not know whose order is whose. So in this case, D is the right answer because it explains the situation. So that's it. That's the visual, question, or that's the visual common sense reasoning task in a nutshell. So still, you probably have a lot of questions. Like, 
How do we collect these challenging common sense inferences and do them at scale? How do we model this? And how do we get the wrong answers? So hopefully, oh yeah. I have a more basic question. Yeah. Go ahead. The second set of questions is yeah. only related to the correct answer. Yes, exactly. So is the model, like if they pick any of the other ones, it's wrong. If they pick yep. the correct one, they're given these four. And if they pick the wrong one, they're wrong. Exactly. OK. So you, we want mo models to be able to do both. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense if you, we don't want models to justify wrong answers. Yeah. No yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have enough of that in the world. OK. So, hopefully, so I'll be hopefully answering these in the rest of the talk. And so there are going to be three main contributions with VCR that I'm going to present today. So I've already introduced to you all the task of visual common sense reasoning. So next, I'm going to be talking about how we built, built VCR, which features a new technique called adversarial matching. And then last, I'm going to be talking about recognition to cognition networks, which is a model that we present for this task. So yeah. So the way that you set up the task is like you see the common sense to be uh, for a model to have common sense, to be able to pick up one of the plausible explanations about the answer that it has come up with. Specifically the most plausible. You're given four options. Um, and then you have to pick, predict the best one. So that you can measure the, yep. the, the, the Yep. But are there other aspects of common sense that you guys have included? Uh, uh, or, uh, or how do you, so uh, how do you approach the common sense? Uh, just to give explanations for the answer that the machine has selected, or mm. so, so how, so I guess how do we approach the common sense? I think, I think there's kind of two aspects of this. I think, with the with our question answering setup, there's a wide number of of questions that could be answered, and moreover, by asking models to explain their decisions, that's also forcing models to maybe abstract to to kind of connect this high level reasoning with more recognition level um, understanding. So like you're, you're making this high level prediction because there is that low level feature. That's ideally how it works. So I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully give you some more examples which will kind of show that. Cool. So let's dive right in. So the first question, I guess, is how do we collect these common sense inferences for VCR? Like what kind of common sense are we going to look at? Well, so if you Google common sense reasoning, you won't get much, or Bing it, I guess, in this crowd. Um, even if you try and Google or Bing something more specific, like four people ordering at a diner and one person is pointing, the result is still mostly stock photos. And as you can imagine, this approach will not work very well. And the reason that is is because there's a bias between the world and the world of tagged things. And from my experience, these tags actually don't help very much for coming up with common sense inferences at scale. Our solution instead is to gather the data set implicitly and come up with the annotations ourselves. We'll start with movie clips and we'll extract frames that will hopefully be interesting. So after this, we'll use mask our CNN to uh, detect the objects and provide the segment, uh, segmentations. And we'll do another filtering step where we try and predict the frames that are most interesting for annotation. And these are frames that have several people and objects and also have good lighting. Then workers on Mechanical Turk will ask common sense questions, answer them, and provide rationales that justify their decisions. So this process, I found it works really well for, gener for getting uh, correct answers for each question. If you provide workers with interesting images, provide them with a little bit of context about what's going on in the scene in the form of captions, they, uh, they're really good at uh, asking good questions. Still though, this isn't enough because we need a solution that's going to get us the wrong answers for their data set. So now the, the main question to me is, how do we get the wrong answers while avoiding annotation artifacts like before? Well, so we could use adversarial filtering and I, I already spent the first half of this talk talking a lot about that. But in this task, we want the vision to be the challenging aspect and not so much about detecting weird language. And moreover, we also don't want to introduce stylistic artifacts. So we don't want humans to come up with uh, the wrong answers. We also want to avoid simple data set biases that you might be familiar with other, for other data sets. So many data sets, say, for visual question answering and other tasks suffer from these. So for instance, if I ask you for the question, what color is the shirt, you'd probably guess blue, because that's a pretty generic color, or maybe something else, like red. 
Uh, you probably wouldn't guess teal, violet, or magenta, because these colors just tend to be rarer. The people say these colors less. And we want to construct VCR in a way that encourages models not to just select the safest response. So more than that, here's the insight. Not only do we want uh, to, uh, to have the answers all be relevant, we want several desired qualities. Wrong answers need to be relevant to the question. So without seeing the image, they should be a reasonable choice. And wrong answers must also be different from the correct answer in terms of meaning. And so our key insight is that these will decompose naturally into two NLI problems, for question relevance and for entailment. In question relevance, we're given a question and an answer, and we want to determine whether that answer is the uh, answer for the question or not. And for entailment, we're given two answers, and we want to tell whether or not they have the same meaning. So with adversarial matching, we'll be using these two metrics to recycle right answers that were originally for other questions using a minimum weight bipartite matching approach. We'll then be repurposing them so that they become new wrong answers for other questions. So this is a mouthful, so I'll kind of explain what I mean a little. Here's a picture about what it might look like. For instance, for the question, why are person one and person three holding their foreheads together, the matched or wrong answer here is that person one and person three are praying. So this will answer the question in a reasonable way without seeing the image, but it's different from the right answer for this image, that they're about to kiss. That answer, in turn, got matched to another question. In this example, why do person one and person three have their hands clasped? So in this case, these were two good wrong answers, and I got them simply by flipping the matching. And so I want to mention here that we're going to do this at scale over the entire data set and we'll be performing multiple matchings like this to obtain three wrong answers per question. And that means that since these are all perfect matchings, each answer will be used once as a positive answer for one question and three times as negative answers to other questions, which means that the prior probability of an answer being right is always one-fourth. So that's kind of neat. So, now to accomplish both objectives, we'll use state-of-the-art models for natural language inference like BERT. Still though, these, these objectives inherently trade off. So to, 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 valid to tune them, we use a tunable hyperparameter called lambda, which allows us to balance between the data set being hard for machines and easy for humans. We're going to want it somewhere in the middle so that, it, so, um, so that the task isn't too hard for humans, but it's challenging for machines. And I, so one more thing I want to mention here before I um, end the adversarial matching stuff. This is going to work exactly the same for the rationales too. So you can just do the same thing that I talked about, except now we're doing, uh, we're doing on the wrong rationales. These must be relevant to the question and the correct answer, but they also must be different from the correct rationale. So it's a general technique that works for both halves of this data set. So... I want to answer one reasonable question that might pop up. Yeah. The can you elaborate? Yeah. So essentially, you can balance. So, so say I have a bunch of questions. Uh, sorry, a bunch of answers that are all relevant to the question. Um, and you could almost think about that as in one extreme, all the answers are just exactly the same. Um, that's going to be hard for humans because how do you tell between if all the answers are the same? How do you pick the right one? Um, Whereas if all the answers have to be super different from the right one, then that's going to also be easy for machines because um, it's just like all you have to do is um, look at like the weirdest answer given the context. Do you know what I mean? And, then, and those, those three weird answers that aren't, aren't very related at all will be the matched ones. So does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, we, we have the details in the paper. It's just you combine these objectives by adding them and taking a logarithm. Yeah, OK. Good question. So at this point, you might be asking another reasonable question, which is how do we an answer, handle the diversity of the questions and answers? And so this is kind of important, because one answer might be appropriate for a different question, except for the tags. Like you might have said person four, when for a different image, there aren't even four people. So the solution here is that for each candidate answer or rationale, we'll randomly 
modify its detection tags before computing the question relevance. So here's an example about how this works. For instance, consider the, di the diner image again. For this diner image and for the question that was originally for the diner image, we just found a, a, a wrong answer from this other image where there's like an oil tanker in the background. And the answer to this other image was that he was giving person three directions. And to make it fit for this one on the right, we remap person three to person one. So the details of this aren't that important because we just use a couple of random heuristics. And I don't think any of them are that good. But importantly, we note that none of these has to really be perfect at all. The question relevance model will just pick the, the answers that it likes the most. And it's going to be doing this globally over the entire data set. So it's OK if there are a couple of answers that, um, that don't get matched very well to their match choices. Okay. So I want to pause here and summarize a few cool things about adversarial matching. First, as I said before, there's no answer-only bias. Each answer will appear once as a positive, three times as a negative. So you can't just look at the answer and pick the most generic one. Instead, you have to perform reasoning over the entire question, the answer, and the image. Second, like before, we can arbitrarily raise the bar of difficulty during data set construction. And I think that's like a really important contribution of this kind of almost general framework for building adversarial data sets. So you can use the best adversaries you want for question relevance. Third, entailment NLI means that human validation isn't as important. That structure that's coming from the language means that we actually didn't need humans to get uh, to validate every single data set example to get high human agreement. That just fell out of the entailment objective. Cool. So that's it. That's our data set VCR. So in summary, we have 290,000 questions, over 110,000 images, and each has both rationales and answers. And these questions are diverse and challenging, and we used our new process called adversarial matching to come up with this. So, for the, yeah. So, uh, can you give some information, like for instance, the questions that you have in diversity of the types of the questions? For instance, in VQA, is like uh, there are many yes no questions, like uh, content again. So, uh, do you have some uh, uh, details of the types of questions when you were collecting them, or you were just using the captions of the videos. Mm. Yeah, so Hamid asked about the types of the questions. And I think, um, so we actually, in our paper, we do have some analysis about what types of inferences we collect. Um, so I suggest you take, t uh, check it out. I unfortunately don't have a slide prepared of that. Um, we find it's actually a, a little bit more complicated to analyze these versus VQA. So a lot of the VQA questions are like, what color or what, uh, what size or like where? Like these are kind of almost... You could boil down the, um, the question type to just the two first words. But for VCR, the questions are often a lot more difficult. Like that, um, that first question about the diner. Like it, it could be a why question, or it could be called like a what happens next question. So I, I, have, like a bunch of, I have a taxonomy of types, um, but they're, they're definitely not as, say, clean as like a what color is or a yes, no question. So yeah. So I'm going to last present the first model for VCR, and it's called Recognition to Cognition Networks. So before I, before I talk about this model, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with how we set up the task. So remember that there are two parts to VCR. There's question answering and answer justification. So in question answering, we have a question, and we want to pick the best answer given four choices. In answer justification, we have a question and the right answer and we want to pick the best rationale. So one key insight from our work is that it's simple to abo approach both tasks in the exact same way. We're going to call the first part the query. And this is the question in the question an uh, answering setup. And it's the question plus the right answer in the answer justification setup. We'll then call the second part the response, or response choices, because there are four of them. And this will be the answer for the question answering setup and the response, or sorry, the rationale in the answer justification setup. So this is kind of nice, because it allows us to train the same model for both tasks. Still, though, we don't, what we don't want is just for a, a one model to answer questions, and then for 
uh, and then increase performance on that, and then for a separate model to justify those answers. That's, we don't want that in the long term. Instead, vision systems, we argue, will need to do both. So we have a new evaluation metric which combines both predictions, which we call the joint or the Q to AR setup. So in this setup, which is what we ultimately care about, a model is going to first answer the question right. And if it answers it right, if and only if it answers it right, it has to then predict the rationale. So that means that if it messes up for either, it's going to get the question wrong. Still, though, yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand. You were saying that you don't want it to be two yeah. separate models, so, but I don't understand why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the question is, that <clears throat> we don't want it to be, do we want it to be two separate models or not? And I think, yeah, maybe that's a good point. Maybe, I think, it, so what I will say is for this work, we use two separate models for each subtask. And I think one of the key insights of our work is that you could approach it in both ways. However, I guess, what I, was, I, guess I kind of misspoke there because what I really meant by that is that um, we don't want uh, to just look at these metrics in isolation. You know what I mean? We don't want to only make progress on question answering. And I mean, though we do report, obviously, both metrics in isolation in the paper, we don't want to just make progress in these one area. It, in this one area of question answering, and then also in this one area of answer justification. At the end of the day, we want uh, models to be able to do both. And actually, this, or maybe I should say systems, because you could think of a system as several submodels. Sure. I think that's a better way of describing it. Sure. I, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, sorry about that. Cool. So I guess our, I guess a model of the, the sub, one of the sub, or sub models of the system is going to be given an image and some objects. And it'll be given a query, which, as I said, is either the question or the question plus the answer. But in this case, it's just the question. And response choices. Here I've just shown one of them, and it happens to be the correct answer. So hopefully it will be correct. So, but in order to make this prediction that this answer was the correct one, we're going to have to first do, we're going to have to do a lot of reasoning, in short. We're going to have to first figure out the meanings of the query and the response and with respect to the image and with respect to each other. And we're going to then need to perform some inference on this representation. So this intuition will be captured by our model, which we call R2C, for recognition to cognition. And it's broken up into three stages, for grounding, contextualization, and for reasoning. So I'll go through these stages in a second. So first, let's start with the grounding set, uh, step. So I want to mention here that before this stage, the model knows nothing about the image or how the objects in the image interact with the query and the response. So I guess it sort of looks like this, which is a lot less colorful. The grounding stage is going to hopefully address this. We're going to start by using a CNN to get image features. And we'll use ROI pooling to extract features for each object. And these features will be used to ground the query and the response with respect to the image. Next, we need language representation somehow. And for this, we use BERT. We're going to represent the language in the query and the response um, independent of the person tags. So at this point, putting it all together, we have two representations for each word. So I have the BERT representations for the language, and we're also going to hang out onto the visual representations. So if the word is a tag, like person4, we'll put the visual features for that object right there. Otherwise, we'll have the visual features for the entire image. And to combine these two representations, we use an LSTM. So that's it for the grounding step. We hopefully get a joint multimodal representation from uh, language and vision. Uh, yeah? So a question related to grounding. Yeah. In the general VGA uh, times, so usually the model uh, will come up with an answer by reading even half of the question. Which can be, which people have tested it by feeding like half the sentence, and uh, which means that it does not read the whole question. And uh, so uh, here, did you guys do any experiment to see if, uh, because when you say, uh, so that's that's uh, about the grounding on the question, uh, but on the image, it's not uh, clear for me when we say grounding. So how do you measure uh, the? if you're actually grounding on the image or not. Is it just accuracy for the task is better? Mm. Yeah, so the question is, yeah. Some, uh, uh, yeah, other, other yeah, so the, I guess the question is, if I'm getting it right, just for, I guess, people who are listening, do we, um, how, how do we know whether the model is actually, like, grounding, if I'm getting it right? And I guess, 
So we have. So I guess what I mean by grounding is, you need to get these vi this visual representation somehow, or at least we do, because when we tried various baselines such as baselines for VQA that don't have this feature, they don't do as well. And the reason is because if I had just asked why is blank pointing at blank, I guess maybe you could resolve it in the um, in this image. Um, but if I, if I said for the response choice that he is telling blank that blank ordered pancakes, that could be false depending on who fills in the blanks. You know what I mean? So you need to somehow resolve this ambiguity. Um, and so, uh, that, so that's kind of where, what, what I mean by grounding. You have to link this tag here, person4, to that region of the image. Or at least people do. I mean, in our, in our experiments... In our ablation study, we, it, it strongly suggests, at least to me, that that's pretty important. But I'll show you the results for that later. So, okay, so that's the grounding step. So we produce grounding represent, grounded representations for the query and the response. So now we need to make sure that the, that the response answers the question in a true way. So we'll need to combine them. And that'll be the role of the contextualization step. So we propose to do this using two attention mechanisms. The first is going to align the words in the query to, or sorry, they align the words in the response to relevant words in the query. So, for instance, hopefully telling here, like the word telling in the response choice, is going to answer the question of why. So the second attention mechanism is going to align the words in the response to other objects that aren't explicitly mentioned. So here, hopefully, we'll align he with person four. So we bladed both of these, and we found that they helped. So that's it for the contextualization step. So now, I want to summarize that we have a rich representation of this one response choice. And it's broken up into three parts. It's broken up into the response, the attended query, and the attended objects. So our last step for the model is the reasoning stage. We'll be reasoning over this representation to decide whether we like this, answer, this response choice or not. So we'll just use an LSTM to perform this reasoning. And after the LSTM, We'll extract a fixed length representation and then use a multilayer perceptron to classify the potential for this response choice. Uh, yeah? So, uh, under the LSTM, is it just the tokens or it is the bird, like the sub tokens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, what, where, the question is where is this representation coming from? And yeah, so this is BERT. Um, so, if, if, oh, okay. Yeah. So, if the two sub tokens are split, you use the token ID to represent, mm. or you just put LSTM on the sub tokens? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, what do we do if BERT splits the tokens? Um, so, in that case, we just average the two um, sub tokens because. So, you average them before feeding it to yep. the times tokens. Yep, exactly. <coughs> so, just so we have uh, normal English tokens. Um, yeah, so hopefully we like this answer because it's right. And that's it. So, the question that you might now have is, how do various models do on VCR? So remember that random performance is 25%. And, well, I'm gonna, I mean, for all of the cases, but in, uh, sorry, for both, I guess, sub-modes. But in this case, I'm going to be focusing on the question and answer mode. So in the question answering setting, human performance is 91%. If you take a model for visual question answering, such as multimodal low-rank bilinear pooling, or MLB, you get... 46% using minimal tweaks to stay faithful with their implementation. BERT actually does a little bit better even by itself at 54%. And our model gets 65%, which is a pretty big gap. Next, let's consider the answer justification setting. So in this setting, I want to emphasize that a model is given a question and an answer, sorry, and the right answer, and it must predict the best rationale that justifies why the right answer is true, given four choices. So humans get 93%. The VQA model drops a little bit to 37%. BERT actually does even better at 65% because probably because there's more text. And our model does even better at 67%. Still though, the most important and holistic setting is where a system composed of two models will have to first predict the right answer and then it will have to predict the right rationale. So this setting is pretty challenging because random performance here is 6% because you have to make two predictions. Humans, though, get 85%. So our model here closes the gap a little bit between machines and humans by 44%. But still, I want to emphasize that there's a lot of room to go. Uh, so yeah. Oh, OK. So the vision mechanism is the same, because you're just using mass cars. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, every, everything. So everything is exactly the same for for this model. It's just the because the, the query and the response formulation um, just kind of applies to both. Yeah. So it's a neat little thing. So I'm going to leave with one example. So here's one example that R2C gets right. The question is, why is person one pointing a gun at person two? The answer, or the answer choices are A, she wants to kill person two. B, person one and person three are robbing the bank, and person two is the bank manager. C, person two has done something to upset person one. And D, because person two is person one's daughter. Person one wants to protect person two. So our, our, our model said that answer B, the right one, was right with 71% probability. The, for the response, trying to predict the best uh, rationale, sorry, for the r rationale, trying to predict the best reason for why answer B is true for this question, the four options are A, person one is chasing person one, and person three because they just robbed a bank. B, robbers will sometimes hold their gun in the air to get everyone's attention. C, the, ball, the vault in the background is similar to a bank vault, and person three is waiting by the vault for someone to open it. And D, a room with barred windows and a counter usually resembles a bank. So the, the model guessed that C is right with 41.9% confidence. And, and I want to plug here and say that v this is all freely available on visualcommonsense.com. And there's even a part of the website where you can browse this example and others like it um, and see how well our model does on them. The R2C, the model that you showed the results on, uh, which was performing better than yep. the online as well? Yeah, so that's, these are all from our model, the R2C model. Yeah. Another cool thing is that we even have a leaderboard now. So one thing I'm pretty excited about is that uh, we already have someone who's doing better than our model. Um, a team from Peking University has beaten us by about 1%. So that's kind of exciting. And in fact, this is even out of date because just yesterday, a team from FAIR uh, beat them by like another half a percent. So these things are climbing. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty excited is to read these papers when they come out. Okay. So since the talk is almost done, I want to just uh, answer some like maybe future work questions about like what's next with this data set. So I want to say that in summary, I think, I, I think VCR is this new interesting test bed for common sense visual reasoning. But I'm still, I'm still unsure about what types of new models will, will do well. Because it's almost like we have these architectures that work well for more recognition-y tasks. So how will we how we'll be able to answer these kinds of reasoning questions that require both, uh, that require knowledge about the world, but also putting it all together in interesting ways and interfacing with the language? And if you're interested in VCR t-shirts, let me know, because I'm going to make them at some point. So in summary, in this talk, I've talked about some new data sets, new interesting ways to make them, like SWAG, a data set for grounded natural language inference, and VCR for visual common sense reasoning. And we had to, to make these data sets and to make them at scale, we had to come up with some new methods that are hopefully going to be useful for new data sets in the future, like adversarial filtering and adversarial matching. And last but not least, I also presented a model called R2C, which is, going, which is the first model for visual common sense reasoning. So that's it. That's my talk. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Uh, like another question is that, so I noticed that you are not using any external knowledge. So when you, for instance, when you are selecting one of those answers, if the answer is like something that does not make sense in natural language, for example, um, I don't know uh, if uh, there is an elephant in a room or a horse on the table, so something like that. So uh, uh, have you tried to use such external knowledge similar to the way that we use on this data set? Or if someone uses those external knowledge, somehow we get some, you know, so, uh, or do you have some way to measure that in this data set? Yeah, I think it's very, very hard because so the question is like how much internal or external knowledge could we use or, or, or could we um, integrate with VCR models? And I think the challenge there is that some of our questions and answers, it's often unclear where we would get the, vis the knowledge needed to answer them. So for instance, maybe this one, like going back to my favorite example, 
why is person four pointing at person one? So like, for that one, I guess there is some explicit knowledge that you have that helps you answer this question. Like, people at restaurants order food, I guess. But it's sort of like, this one, I think, I think in this case, it's, it's, it's less about the, the specific knowledge that you have and more in terms of piecing it all together and performing reasoning over this. Um, and I guess, yeah, so the problem is, but, but if there was like the right representation, I think I would, be, I would be really excited if I could see someone integrate like knowledge bases or something in this uh, to do well on this. Yeah. Uh, another question is that, like for instance, in MeQA, there are some cartoon images with uh, like a, uh, so that the data set does not rely on language biases to come up with an answer. So do you guys have such examples in the CR data set, or do you think adding such examples could uh, benefit it to not rely on language problems? Yeah, so the question is like, um, can, could we use like cartoon images that are balanced necessarily to avoid language bias? And so I think here, I think it's kind of it's kind of complicated. Um, so I th I think the 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 thing is, and we actually did a lot of experiments in the supplemental section where we find that a lot of VQA data sets, like not VQA because the answers are so simple, but a lot of other ones that have this multiple choice setting, you can just run BERT on them, and then that does actually surprisingly well. And in some cases, it exceeds the state of the art on these data sets, even without visual features. So that's kind of exciting, um, but I think I think the reason so there is a little bit of bias in our data set, and the reason I think there's a couple of reasons for this, but to me I guess I'm not very worried about it because what I care about is that there's headroom for visual um, understanding to improve. So I think that uh, I think that I, I'm not as confident that. Um, what is it? I guess if you ran, say, like Big Bird on this, it would do much better than Bert, just mainly because um, at the end of the day, uh, all of the answers are at least somewhat relevant as judged by a different Bert model, and they all come from real answers. So stylistically, by themselves, they tend to be pretty good, even though the remapping sometimes makes a couple of errors. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's it's a yeah, it's complicated. And the results that you show for BERT, was it BERT base or BERT large? Yeah, so we did everything with BERT base, including, or sorry, the, whether this is, yeah. Um, we did everything in our paper with BERT base, including our, our model, but also including the data set creation. So my guess is that if you did everything with BERT large, you'd get similar things. And in fact, um, I, some of my colleagues at AI2 have found that, yeah, if you use BERT large, you get a couple of points improvement. But, but you could also use the same improvement on RGC, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. You could you could plug Bert Large to an RGC and get improvement. Yeah. Yes, there is no more questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Thank for coming. You.